Let me introduce our debaters tonight. The first one in from Florida is Dr. Michael Roos. He'll be answering in the affirmative. Well, what is it he's answering in the affirmative? This particular and specific debate question, which is the question of the night. Natural processes are sufficient to explain the origin and the complexity of the cell. He'll be arguing that tonight. Michael Roos is a philosopher and a historian of science who was awarded an MA in philosophy from McMaster University in 1964. He then did doctoral work at the University of Bristol and was awarded a PhD in 1970 uh, for his dissertation, The Nature of Biology. He taught at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada for several decades and since 2000, Professor Roos has served as the Lucille T. Werkmeister Professor of Philosophy at Florida State University. Dr. Roos has contributed to and written scores of books and articles, including The Darwinian Revolution and Darwinism Defended and the forthcoming Atheism, What Everyone Should Know. Dr. Roos, please come up and join us. I feel I should do something like this, you, you know? <laughs> we, forgot the, we forgot the Rocky music. Uh, I'm on, he's this side. Is this the right I'm one? I'm this side. Or over here. You're on this side. Okay, fine. On my right hand. The arm of power. The person who will be answering the question in the negative, that is, he'll be saying natural processes are not sufficient to explain the origin and the complexity of the cell, is Dr. Fuzz Rana. He was a presidential scholar at West Virginia University where he earned an undergraduate degree in chemistry with highest honors. He completed a PhD in chemistry with an emphasis in biochemistry at Ohio University and twice won the Donald Clippinger Research Award. Postdoctoral studies took him to the universities of Virginia and Georgia before he landed at Procter & Gamble as a senior scientist in product development for several, several years. Dr. Rana has authored, co-authored books such as Origins of Life, Who Was Adam, and most recently, The Cell's Design, and has published numerous articles in peer-reviewed scientific journals. He's now a vice president of apologetics at Reasons to Believe Ministry, and we can't wait to hear from him, Dr. Root. Dr. Rana, please join us on stage. Are you gentlemen ready for action? Very nice. <laughs> All right, give a warm round of applause to Dr. Michael Roos as he leads off in an opening statement 20 minutes from the podium. The, the black one right there. Is, do you mind going to that one? Which one am I looking? The, the, the black podium right there. Oh, I see. Oh, okay. You, you got your notes? You mean I make all the mistakes That's, and then he knows, and he does it really smoothly after me. That's right. Okay. There's your clicker. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much for inviting me, and particularly to Lenny Esposito, who was standing there, and who is the person, as it were, the eminence grise behind this. And I want to say what a great, very great pleasure it is to be invited here. Uh, I'm particularly pleased if I can embarrass one of my own students who still hasn't finished his PhD yet. But Dan, stand up, would you? Uh, Dan is t uh, teaching here in California. And, uh, he's going to be working very hard on science and religion all summer. Um, it, it's a great deal, it gives me a great deal of pleasure uh, to come here and to talk to you tonight. Um, I must confess, I, I don't normally have, I, I won't say the collywobbles, but I don't normally have moments of self-doubt. I'm, I'm not much given to those. Uh, but I did rather wonder, why me for this particular uh, debate? Uh, it's not so much that I'm not a scientist, I'm not a scientist, I've, I don't want to be one. I, I never have been, and I never will be. I'm, I'm a historian and philosopher of science. But my speciality, or my, what shall I say, my expertise, is particularly in the area of Darwinism and evolution generally. And so it did cross my mind, more than cross my mind, 
Why on earth, then, would somebody like me uh, get right into the whole much more technical discussion about the whole question of the origin of life and the complexity of the cell? And am I qualified to talk about this? And I thought about it, and I realized that perhaps it's not a bad thing that I'm not an expert on this, because I very much suspect that most of you aren't either. And um, in a way then, we're coming at it together. And the question is, what about people like us, people of goodwill, people who I'd like to say have got a certain intelligence, who are prepared to, to, to read things, if not necessarily the technical material, but uh, Scientific American or the New York Times or LA Times, this sort of thing, um, and have got to judge these things. And how can we do this? And can we, as it were, come to some sort of decision, or do we just, as it were, let, let the experts do the talking and then we vote without really thinking about it. And so I think we can. And what I want to do with you tonight is very much share with you that kind of exploration, that kind of journey, uh, so that we can, at some level, come to some decisions. Now, I seem, I've got a beautiful picture of myself, but I, oh, there we are. So as I see it, what we have, what we're talking about tonight, then, is the origin, but then also the nature, the complexity of the cell. So we're, this is the issue that we're talking about. And I think that we're lucky uh, in the sense that we have two very clear-cut uh, explanatory models which are being put forward tonight in order to come to some sort of answer about that. On the one hand, we've got the position that I'm endorsing tonight, the naturalistic position. This is one which ultimately, basically, starts with evolution and says, yes, in order to understand the origin and the complexity, the nature of the cell, then the secret must be natural laws and natural laws of a particular kind, evolutionary laws. Uh, in particular, I'm going to myself endorse the position that all organisms are descended from common ancestor or common, a, a group of common ancestors. That at least very early on, the main mechanism of change is going to be natural selection. Certainly after the cell is up and running and as the cell develops its complexity, natural selection is going to be the name of the game combined with random changes known as mutations. Now, they're not random in the sense of uncaused, but they're random in the sense that they don't have some immediate intent. They're not, as it were, consciously designed. Now, I see, that doc I see my, my fellow debater, I see his position is that at some level, what we're dealing with is what he calls in one of his books an intelligent agency. Now, uh, that in some sense, a thinking being is directly responsible for the making of the cell, the designing of the cell, the creating of the cell, and if I say the, the development of the cell, I don't mean to put evolutionary words into my uh, fellow debater's uh, mouth, but at least the subsequent history of the cell, that an intelligent designer is there doing his or her work all of the time. Now, notice that there are some questions here which I'm certainly going to be raising before the evening is over, because if you speak of an intelligent designer, one of the questions one wants to ask is, is this a natural uh, intelligent designer? Is this a natural being? Or is this a supernatural being? Is this a god? You might say, well, surely it has to be a god. Well, not necessarily so quickly. Maybe we're all an experiment by a graduate student uh, on Andromeda who's writing his dissertation <laughs> on the development of life, and we're his, you know, we're his lab. Now, I don't believe that. I don't think that uh, Dr. Rana believes that either. But I think at least until we're told why we shouldn't believe it, it's an option on the table. Uh, 
are we talking designers? When we talk in terms of designers, if you think of a motor car, an automobile, for instance, it's very rare, if not virtually impossible, that one would ever have just one designer. There's always a team working at this. So are we talking in terms of one designer, or are we talking in terms of a team of designers? Uh, how powerful is this being? Is this being something which can change the laws of nature as he or she will? Or is this being something which has to take the laws of nature for granted and works within the context of those? And of course, questions like, uh, particularly, how does this being do its work? Now, as I say, I think these are all questions which are raised by the, the alternative position. I'm not saying that aren't any answers, but I think that that's something that one must keep in mind. Now, if we look at the cell, and I mean, I just got, you know, like you would, I went to Wikipedia to get this. Uh, if we look at the cell, I don't know about you folks, but when I look at the cell, I say, oh my goodness, that sure as hell looks designed to me. I mean, that doesn't seem to me to be something which, you know, is just randomly put together. It doesn't seem to me like just a, a, a pile of old junk, which as it were, was dumped out. That looks to me like something that somebody worked very, very hard to produce. So I don't want to deny, I don't want to deny that we're dealing with design-like phenomena. Now that's not part of what I'm saying tonight. I'm not saying that the design question is irrelevant or even false. And one of the facts, things I want to say, in fact, is I think that we've got a little bit of a false dichotomy that we're working with here. And this, of course, is something that Charles Darwin himself thought. I'm not sure that we necessarily have to, tonight have to make a decision between evolution or design. Certainly, I don't necessarily want to have design by miracles, but I'm not sure that anything I'm going to say tonight will rule out talking in terms of design. And Charles Darwin said, I see no necessity in the belief that the eye was expressly designed. On the other hand, I cannot anyhow be contented to view this wonderful universe, and especially the nature of man, and to conclude that everything is the result of brute force. I am inclined to look at everything as, the re as resulting from designed laws with the details, whether good or bad, left to the working out of what we may call chance. So at least within the context of this evening, I want you to know that I'm not arguing against design. Now, I think there are arguments you might bring against design, so please don't, I'm not pretending to be a, a, a Christian or anything like that, but I'm saying in the context of tonight, I'm not sure that that's a dichotomy that we need face. Now, the way I come at this whole problem is I think we've got to be awfully careful not to commit what I'm going to call the fallacy of selective attention or illicit focus. Look, what you're looking at is the well-known Indian rope trick. Somebody climbs up a rope and, you know, if they're really good, vanishes at the top. And you look at this and you say, oh my God, oh my God, <laughs> Newton was wrong. Gravity doesn't work. And then you say, now, hang on a minute, hang on a minute. You know, of course gravity works. Of course gravity works. We're not, we don't just look at the Indian rope trick in isolation. We take it in context. We ask ourselves, why would we say that the Indian rope trick must be a trick and not magic? Why don't we think Newton's laws, why do we think Newton's laws don't hold or do hold in a case like this? Why do we think that there's something fishy going on here? And the answer, of course, is we're not just judging the Indian rope trick taken on its own, but against the background of our knowledge that magic simply doesn't work and that Newton's laws do. And I do want to say, going back to something like the cell, I think we've got to be awfully careful not to say, now, Professor Roos, we're talking about the cell. Just talk about the cell. I don't want to hear about anything else. We're talking about the cell. And I want to say that would be the same as somebody saying, 
okay, Professor Roos, we're talking about the Indian rope trick. Tell me why Newton's laws aren't false. And I'm going to say, I'm not going to be boxed in like that, and neither should we, and I don't think we should be tonight. So my argument very much, and it's going to be the argument all through this evening, is we don't just look at the cell on its own and say, oh my goodness, it's so complex, works so well, it must have been designed in a hands-on way. When I say designed miraculously, we judge the cell against all of our background knowledge. That includes our knowledge of evolution through natural selection at the macro level. So in other words, what I'm going to stress this evening is that this debate must be put in the context of everything that we know. All right. Well, what would be my position? I don't want to, uh, having, as it were, laid out some sort of philosophical background, I don't want to be fuzzy on what I believe or what I think is the case. I want to say something along the following lines. The Earth is about four and a half billion years old. Life began somewhere less than four billion years ago, more than three and a half billion years ago, that the first cells were primitive cells, prokaryotes, and then about two billion years ago, the more complex cells, you, of which we're made up, eukaryotes came along, and then, and of course we're not talking about this tonight, the sorts of organisms that we're acquainted with came round about the Cambrian explosion about half a billion years ago. So this is the background against which I think we're arguing tonight. I think that the origin of the cell, I. I would want to say we don't, there's, or we, know, we, we know less than we know on the origin of the cell, but I would say that we're starting slowly and painfully to block out a picture of how the cell came into being. It started off with uh, organic compounds being formed naturally, what is known as the pre prebiotic soup. Then we get the early macromolecules, chain-like molecules. Uh, after that, at some point, we get the uh, we get a rib probably ribonucleic acid, which is something which can uh, replicate itself. At some later point, we get the DNA molecule and the making of proteins, and somewhere along the line, everything gets enclosed in some sort of lipid bubble or something of this nature. So this, I think, is the basic picture that we've got. And then, as I say, somewhere about two, uh, two billion years ago, we get this massive change from the prokaryotes to the eukaryotes. And I want to talk just a little bit about this because this, in fact, was work which was done by a very good friend of mine who died a year or two ago. We've got two kinds of cells, as I've already explained to you, the prokaryotes. These are simple cells with no nucleus, and the eukaryotes, which are complex cells with a nucleus. And they've also got cell parts known as organelles, chloroplasts, which make uh, chlorophene, uh, mitochondria, which are the power packs of the cells and other organelles. And the interesting thing about these cell parts is that they exist in their own right with their own DNA. And the theory that we hold today is due to this woman, Lynn Margulis. And in the 1960s, Lynn, who incidentally at that time was known as Lynn Sagan, because she was married to, Lynn, to, uh, to uh, Sagan, uh, Carl Sagan, the astronomer, Lynn had an insight. She said, I think the way that the cells, uh, the, the complex cell, the eukaryote was formed, is not miraculously. It's formed out of prokaryotes. So these are the prokaryotes you can see on the left. These are the simple cells. Eukaryotes, uh, these are the ones on the right, the complex cells, and as you can see, they have their, not only the nucleus, but they also have different cell parts, the organelles. And Lynn's theory, which is known as endosymbiosis, is quite simple, that some prokaryotes swallowed other prokaryotes, but that those that were swallowed didn't necessarily get digested and into non-being, that what happened was they kept their integrity and went on working within the outer cell. So you've got this symb symbiosis. 
and that this was the way that the eukaryote cell was formed. Now, when she published this in 1965, it took her 17 attempts to publish it. Everybody said it's nonsense, and nobody believed it. 15 years later, they were they sufficiently sophisticated that they could, they could map the DNA and check the DNA. And what they found was that organelles, these particular organelles that Lynn had focused on, in fact have exactly the same DNA as some free-flowing or free-living prokaryotes, rather disgusting ones, I think. Yellow fever, I think, is one. And of course, then what one had got was proof positive that what Lynn had done was what Lynn had proposed was absolutely right. Now, what you've got here is a naturalistic evolution of something going on, because as soon as this happens, natural selection picks it up and works with it and develops it. And now, of course, we can work out the history of things that we know, for instance, that clearly the first organelles taken in with the mitochondria, the power plants, uh, and then later on, because we don't convert sunlight into energy, the plants did it again and got chloroplasts, and the plants have these other cells which came in. Now, what I want to say is that this is perfectly natural. It is a, a developmental sequence. But as, I, as I've said, I don't in any sense see some, this as something which necessarily goes against design. I think if one was a believer, one could say, God works in a miraculous way his wonders to perform, but he worked, his miracles are done through unbroken law. What about some of the more complex things like the bacterial flagellum? the sort of whip-like tail which pushes things along, the, um, which pushes things along. You take one part out and it doesn't function. People like my fellow debaters say, these must have been done miraculously because otherwise uh, it wouldn't work if they were put together. Well, you run into problems if you take a miraculous position because there isn't just one flagellum. There are many, there are literally hundreds of thousands of flagella, flagellin, as they're called in the plural, and they're quite different, some of them. Some circulate this way, others circulate that way. Some wiggle, some don't. Some do one thing, some do another. Which ones do we think they are? Much more likely that in fact these evolve, that's what you get with evolution, you get variation. Much more likely because in some cells you get flagella which don't work, they're vest vestigial organisms or, or characteristics which is what you expect in evolution. And what's interesting is the cell parts again and again, the parts of the flagellum come from other things this is known as exaptation, where one feature is picked up and used for something else. Feathers which are used for warming are then used for flying. Characteristics which are used for injecting poisons from one organism into another, very similar to the flagellum, are then adapted to be, to be able to move things along. And so here again, I think, we get a case where a naturalistic and evolutionary explanation gives us the kind of solution that we want. And I'm going to end on this point. How do we explain cases of bad design? What about T cells, which are needed for the immune system? What about T cells? Why were they not immune against the HIV virus? And if it's a designer, hands-on designer, then as Charles Darwin said, I don't think much of that. Much better to have it all happen through unbroken law. Thank you. We'll now hear from Dr. Fuzz Rana, his opening statement, 20 minutes. Thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to be here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for coming, and thank you for the organizers for all the hard work in putting on this event. You could say, I think, safely that this was intelligently designed. So, Anyway, um, what I'm going to do tonight is basically argue that natural processes are not sufficient to explain the origin of life and the complexity of the cell. 
In fact, I'm going to go one step further and actually argue that when we look at the scientific evidence at hand, it actually indicates that life's origin, and again, the, the structure of the cell, reflects the work of an intelligent agent. And in order to make my point tonight, I'm going to develop four lines of argumentation. The first is that all avenues taken to explain the origin of life through chemical evolution have led to dead ends. The second point I'm going to make is that work in prebiotic chemistry, which is designed to give insight and to validate chemical evolution, actually ironically demonstrate the necessity of intelligent agency in bringing about uh, the origin of life. Uh, work in synthetic biology where scientists are trying to explain or sorry, check that, are trying to create artificial cells in the laboratory, affirm the conclusion of the work in prebiotic chemistry. And then finally, the structure and the function of biochemical systems allows us to revitalize the watchmaker argument for God's existence, and in doing so, make a case, again, for intelligent design. Let me go ahead and, and make my first point. Now, Dr. Ruse described in very general terms uh, a textbook description for how scientists think the origin of life happened. But when you actually survey the scientific literature over the last 60 years, what you discover are myriad ideas that have been proposed by origin of life researchers. It's an incredibly complex landscape of ideas, and this diagram is taken from a book that I wrote with uh, Dr. Hugh Ross, an astronomer, called Origins of Life, where we attempted to try to give some organization to these ideas and show how they interrelate. And it's interesting to note that regardless of the specific model at hand, when you look at the origin of life question from a, an evolutionary perspective, there are key features that every model has to have in place. A source of prebiotic materials, a way to concentrate these prebiotic materials some, in some location on the early Earth, a way to generate life's building blocks, a process to assemble those building blocks into complex molecules. You have to account for the origin of self-replication. You have to account for the origin of metabolism. You have to account for the emergence of protocells. And then finally, explain how that protocellular entity evolves into the last universal common ancestor. What I'm going to do in my opening statement uh, with regard to the first point is focus on the uh, these three um, ideas, namely the development of self-replication, the emergence of metabolism, and the aggregation of these systems to form protocells. Now, this is, uh, these are very important steps in the origin of life because they essentially are looking to explain certain central features to, that all living organisms possess, namely that they operate um, uh, on, the, uh, on the basis or the outworkings of information-rich molecules. For example, proteins carry out virtually every activity inside the cell. The information needed to drive the production of those proteins and coordinate the operation of the cellular systems are information-rich molecules in the form of nucleic acids. And self-replication involves the duplication of information-rich molecules. Intermediary metabolism refers to a network of interacting uh, uh, chemical reactions in which small molecules interconvert through, again, an elaborate series of chemical pathways. And these small molecules generate the life's building, generate life's building blocks and also are uh, the byproducts of breakdown that generate energy for the cell to use. And of course, cell membranes are the boundary that separate the interior of the cell from the exterior environment. And these central features for life, as well as the requirements of all origin of life explanations, have led to three different approaches to the origin of life known as replicator first, metabolism first, and membrane first scenarios. And what you see is that when you evaluate these scenarios, there are fundamental intractable problems that essentially invalidate each approach. For example, with regard to replicator for scenarios, in order for a molecule to be a self-replicator, it has to be a homopolymer. A homopolymer is a, a large molecule comprised of smaller subunit molecules, and the backbone of that homopolymer has to have a regular repetitive uh, unit uh, that comprises it. It has to be 
a homopolymer. The backbone has to be, again, identical. This is a chemical requirement for self-replication. And as the late chemist Robert Shapiro demonstrated, when you take into account the complexity of the chemical environment on the early Earth, there are so many different interfering chemical reactions that exist that the, the generation of a homopolymer is virtually impossible. And this problem is fundamental regardless of what you think the first self-replicating entity might be. In fact, the problem is so severe along not only the homopolymer problem, but other problems associated with self-replication uh, or replicator first uh, scenarios that the, uh, that the late Leslie Orgel said it would be a miracle if a strand of RNA ever appeared on the primitive Earth. With respect to metabolism first scenarios, again, you're looking at these networks of chemical reactions involving small molecules. And these, uh, ca these catalytic networks, sorry, these chemical networks have to have some form of catalysis in order to drive the reaction of one, uh, of a reactant into a product. And the problem here is that mineral surfaces, which have been proposed as the catalytic uh, materials for these proto-metabolic systems, have limited catalytic range, meaning that the products are going to have to migrate to other mineral sites in order for that pathway to, uh, to be sustained. And this, again, is an, a virtually an impossible scenario. Uh, Le Leslie Orgel also said with respect to metabolism first scenarios that these would require an appeal to magic, a series of remarkable conditions, uh, a near miracle. With regard to membrane first scenarios, this is where I've actually contributed to the origin of life problem. Uh, a chemist, Jackie Thomas, and I wrote an article a few years ago where we evaluated membrane first scenarios. And what we showed is that in membrane first scenarios, each step in the process requires exacting environmental and chemical conditions in order for, again, that step in the membrane first scenario to transpire. And it turns out that each step requires a different set of in, in, exacting conditions, meaning that the pathway is essentially self-stultifying. The bottom line is that you cannot explain the origin of life through the outworkings of chemistry and physics. Now, my second point is that work in prebiotic chemistry, ironically, demonstrates the necessity of an intelligent agent. Now, when you look at the scientific literature, you see a lot of experiments that have been done over the last 60 years that seem on the surface to support the notion of chemical evolution, where scientists go in the laboratory and they can generate life's building blocks, can assemble them into polymeric materials, they can generate uh, RNA molecules with a wide range of catalytic properties, they can generate self-replicating systems and, and, and generate protocellular entities. The problem with these experiments, however, is that they represent false success, not genuine success. At best, they simply demonstrate proof of principle. But as soon as you try to take the chemistry that's done in a laboratory environment and translate it to the conditions of the early Earth, the chemistry breaks down. It's not productive. That is, the chemistry discovered in the laboratory is not geochemically relevant. And in order to demonstrate geochemical relevance, you have to be able to, in the laboratory, design, again, a realistic experiments that take into account the concentrations of materials on the early Earth, the energy sources that would be available. You have to take into account chemical interference. You have to take into account chemical stability. And another very important factor that has to be considered is researcher intervention, because these prebiotic simulation experiments are done with the oversight of organic chemists. And organic chemists, of course, would not have been present on the early Earth. And so you have a real problem with researcher intervention. And in fact, the researcher intervention, in my opinion, is unwarranted in virtually every prebiotic simulation experiment. Let me just illustrate with one example. Uh, this has to do with the RNA world scenario. This is one of the leading ideas in origin of life research that basically says the very first biochemical systems were exclusively RNA-based, and that this RNA world later invented the DNA protein world through uh, an evolutionary process. Now, there's a lot of lines of evidence that people cite in favor of the RNA world model, one of which are experiments done in a laboratory showing that you can start with RNA building blocks and assemble fairly long RNA polymers using clay as a catalytic surface. But when you examine these experiments in detail, what you discover is that these are, again, highly unrealistic experiments. 
where you ha the researchers have been careful to exclude chemical interference that would prevent the ch RNA chains from growing, or exclude chemical interference that would cause the RNA chains to break down once they formed. The researchers stopped the experiment at the just right time to prevent the RNA molecules from becoming too long, because if they become too long, they become irreversibly absorbed onto the clay surface. And the clays that are used have to come from a particular source. They have to be processed by the supplier in a particular way. They have to be, then be treated in the laboratory in a particular way to prepare them to function as catalysts. And oh, by the way, the building block materials are chemically activated to ensure that they would react. Paul Davies puts it this way, as far as biochemists can see, it is a long and difficult road to produce efficient RNA replicators from scratch. The conclusion has to be that without a trained organic chemist on hand to supervise, nature would be struggling to make RNA from a dilute soup under any plausible prebiotic conditions. Simon Conway Morris generalizes this problem to say many of the experiments designed to explain one or other step in the origin of life are either of tenuous relevance to any believable prebiotic setting or involve an experimental rig in which the hand of the researcher becomes for all intents and purposes the hand of God. The bottom line here is prebiotic simulation experiments are actually empirically demonstrating the central importance of an intelligent agent in order to bring life into existence. And this conclusion is affirmed by work in synthetic biology, where the goal of scientists is to create artificial cells in the laboratory. And one approach is a bottom-up approach, where scientists start with simple chemicals and then try to assemble them into these chemical super systems that again assume many of the properties of life. And when you examine this work, what you, what you note is that this, this work is only successful because you have some of the best minds in the world employing rather sophisticated and elaborate strategies to carry out these experiments. These strategies uh, spawn very sophisticated protocols that require highly skilled chemists and biochemists to go into the laboratory utilizing sophisticated chemical instrumentation to carry out the production of protocells. That is, intelligent agents is necessary. Let me illustrate with one example. This is work that was published in 2008 in Science in which a team of researchers designed an enzyme from scratch that could carry out what's known as an aldol condensation. This is a chemical reaction that does not occur in biological systems. And in order to create this enzyme from scratch, these researchers employed a, an elaborate strategy that involved modeling the transition state, determining how to stabilize that transition state by surrounding it with chemical groups, by taking that understanding and then designing an enzyme active site and then building a protein that would fold to produce that enzyme active site. And then once this was d done, they then went into the laboratory and produced the enzymes and then vary the enzyme structure, fine-tuning it to produce an enzyme that would function. This work required a, a team of uh, computer scientists, uh, uh, sorry, a team of uh, quantum chemists, a team of computational chemists, protein engineers, biochemists, and molecular biologists. And it took hundreds of hours of supercomputer time, the use of massive databases of protein structures derived from studying proteins found in nature, again, highly skilled chemists and sophisticated laboratory equipment to carry out this work. And the product of this work was an enzyme that quite frankly was laughable in terms of its performance compared to the enzymes that are found in biochemical systems. The, the authors conclude their paper this way, although our results demonstrate that novel enzyme activities can be designed from scratch and indicate the catalytic strategies that are most accessible to nascent enzymes, there is still a significant gap between the activities of our design catalysts and those of naturally occurring enzymes. Uh, my final point is this, that when we look at the structure and function of biochemical systems, they help us to revitalize the watchmaker argument, an argument uh, advanced by William Paley in the late 1700s that basically said, as a watch requires a watchmaker, life requires a creator. In Paley's day, a watch was the pinnacle of engineering achievement, and what William Paley noted is that a watch has certain properties that distinguish it from materials that are clearly produced through natural processes. 
And, and Paley argued that as a watch requires a watchmaker and living systems, biological systems, share many of the same properties as a watch. Therefore, one could rightly conclude that life requires a creator. And what's interesting to me as a biochemist is that when we have, what we have learned about biochemical systems is that their defining features are, are identical to the same features that we would recognize as evidence for the work of a human designer. In other words, when human beings design and create and invent, we produce systems that have certain characteristics. And when we look at the, the structure of biochemical systems and how they function, they again have those same characteristics. And so we can revitalize the watchmaker argument. And I'm just going to give you one example of, again, the similarity between biochemical designs and man-made designs by turning to the information-rich molecules that are found in bio, biochemical systems, namely nucleic acids and proteins. Now what's interesting is that these systems um, are, are remarkable in their similarity to, um, again, man-made information systems. For example, Leonard Adelman, who is a computer scientist at the University of Southern California, recognized that the enzymes that operate on DNA are literally functioning as Turing machines. And a Turing machine is an abstract machine invented by the British mathematician Alan Turing that essentially forms the, fa the theoretical foundation for how computer systems operate. And Leonard Adelman realized that these enzymes that are manipulating DNA are functioning as actual Turing machines and, and employed that insight to, to found an area of nanotechnology called DNA computing where scientists are using the information in DNA in the same way that a computer scientist would treat a string of data and then are manipulating that data using the enzymes in cells, stringing, again these tur stringing together these Turing machines to perform incredibly complex computations. Again, the similarity between man-made designs and biochemical designs is absolutely startling. Now, in addition to that, Donald McDonald at Trinity University in Dublin, Ireland, has actually discovered that built within the structure of DNA itself is something known as an even bit parity code. And this is an, a, a coding device that computer scientists use to detect error in data transmission. And again, what's, uh, what's uh, remarkable to me is the similarity between these biochemical systems and man-made constructs, which again helps us to revitalize the watchmaker argument. The, 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 the information systems inside the cell are ultimately defined by something known as the genetic code, which is a set of rules that relates the information in DNA and RNA into the information found in proteins. And it turns out that in recent years, researchers have discovered that the genetic code found in nature is exquisitely optimized for error minimization. In fact, the genetic code in nature exists as a statistical outlier compared to any conceivable random genetic code that could have been generated through chemical evolution. This has led Simon Conway Morris to say that the genetic code in nature displays eerie perfection and startling evidence of optimization. And again, optimization is a characteristic of man-made systems. And so the point here is that, again, biochemical Designs are eerie in their similarity to man-made designs. This allows us to develop a revitalized watchmaker argument and in turn use that to, to buttress the conclusions of other lines of argumentation I made tonight that namely life requires the work of an intelligent agent. What I've demonstrated by looking at replicator first scenarios, metabolism first scenarios, and membrane first scenarios is that there are fundamental intractable problems with the details associated with chemical evolution. That work in prebiotic chemistry ironically demonstrates the central importance of an intelligent agent. That synthetic biology in the attempts to create artificial life in the lab affirm that conclusion. And that finally, again, the structure and function of biochemical systems allows us to revitalize a formal argument for design, namely the watchmaker argument. Thank you. We're moving into the first session of cross-examination, and we are going to have uh, Dr. Michael Roos be the interrogator towards uh, Dr. Fuzz Rana. In other words, he's going to ask the hard questions, and he's going to try to answer them. You with us? All right, six minutes to do this, and then we will switch roles. Ready? Go. Uh, Craig, are we going to sit here and speak this, to each this other? Is it. 
I, I, I think it would make more yes. sense if we did it that way. Well, a... now, I was listening to what you were saying, with, obviously with, int with great interest, um, but we're here talking about two models. We're here talking about two positions. Mine, the naturalistic position, and yours, the in intelligent designer position, or the intelligent uh, agent position. And I want to know a little bit more about your position. Um, you didn't actually give us the hypothesis that I find, for instance, in your book uh, that you wrote with Dr. Ross, The Origins of Life, and I, I want to quote you on this. And your model says, life appeared early in Earth's history while the planet was still in a primordial state. Uh, the backdrop for the origin of life in Genesis 1-2 was an early earth enveloped entirely in water and yet untransformed by tectonic and volcanic activity. This tenet anticipates the discovery of life's remains in the part of the geological column that corresponds to early earth. So, in other words, it's clear, I mean, you're quite explicit about this, that your position is one which is based on Genesis, on a reading of Genesis in particular, the second verse of Genesis. Now, I want to know where the hell the sun is at this point. I mean, what's going on here? We've got an earth, we've got an earth here, and yet, as I read it, and I'm staying in a hotel, so I've borrowed the Gideon Bible for the evening. <laughs> we carry them on our iPhones uh, yeah. now. <laughs> you carry them on your You work at Biola, the Bible Institute of Los Angeles. <laughs> I don't. And then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. And that was on the, the fourth day. So now I... I I want to know what your position is. I mean, are you saying that we've got this earth which is sort of suspended like that and then the sun comes along or what exactly? Okay, well, um, our view is that uh, the Genesis 1 creation account is a, a natural history of life, uh, sorry, of the earth and life on earth. And that we would argue that um, if this, text is inspired by a creator, uh, that it should be essentially uh, a text that co corresponds to uh, the, the scientific record. And so we would argue that the appropriate frame of reference when you're looking at the Genesis 1 account, we take days as a long period of time, so I'm an old earth creationist. I think the earth is four and a half billion years old. Life's been present on earth 3.8 billion years uh, or so. Uh, so we take day as a long period of time, but the frame of reference for the Genesis 1 account is not a hypothetical observer looking from outer space down on the planet, but a hypothetical observer on the surface of the planet looking upward, because Genesis 1-2 tells us that the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. And so the text is telling us that initially there's darkness everywhere, and so it means that the sun is not visible it doesn't mean it's not there, it's just simply not visible in the Genesis 1-2 passage. On the first day of creation, there is a transformation of the atmosphere that now allows light to penetrate to the surface of the planet. On day four, what you're looking at is um, the, a, a further transformation of the atmosphere, so the heavenly bodies are now visible to that hypothetical observer. And the text in the original Hebrew doesn't say that uh, the sun, moon, and stars were created, it says, let them appear. Let the, and so uh, it's not describing the creation, but the, rather the appearance. And in fact, there's a, a parenthetical statement that reminds the reader that the, the sun, moon, and stars were created by God, uh, but their first appearance was on day four, but that doesn't mean that that's when they, they were created. Then what you're saying is, as most of us read Genesis then, it's profoundly misleading. No, I don't think well, it's... Well, it is. I, I mean, look, it says, then God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. I mean, God made, God made, those, God made the sun and the earth and, and the moon on the fourth day. He made the light earlier. No, I mean, the text isn't saying that because that, that's essentially making a statement about a past activity that God engaged in. And so the... the uh, the text in the original Hebrew is giving the impression that the sun, moon, and stars appeared, but not that they were created. 
So I don't think that Genesis 1 is misleading at all, uh, but you keep in mind it's written in he biblical Hebrew and then translated into English. A and the message of Genesis 1 is very, very clear, I think. But then, uh, just to go back to Genesis 1, Genesis 1, 2, and I, 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 mean, I don't mean to just spend our evening cutting this, but this is your position in your book. And God, the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. I don't see anything about organisms there. Is that in the original Hebrew? No. And, oh. <laughs> okay. And that's, that's a, we got just a few seconds. That's a, a good point, and we actually explain uh, how we arrive at that position in the book Origins of Life. But basically, it's not a direct statement, but it's an inference that we're drawing from the text, given, uh, given the language and how Genesis 1-2 relates to another passage of Scripture uh, uh, called the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32, where Moses had uh, the Genesis 1-2 account in mind when he described, essentially, Israel's delivery uh, from Egypt. Uh, but when you take that imagery and transpose it to Genesis 1-2, you can make a reasonable inference that there was something on the surface of the earth that was of a, a tremendous value and importance to the Creator. And so in the book, we simply draw the inference that that was perhaps something uh, akin to the origin of life. But, you know, arguably, uh, that, that, that's, a, that's essentially an interpretation. But based on that, we then develop a model. All right, we're now switching roles. Yep. Uh, Dr. Rana is going to be the interrogator, and uh, Dr. Roos is going to answer questions, uh, Bible questions. Oh. Okay. Um, how much do you feel that philosophy plays in, in this discussion? And, and what I mean by that is um, to take a, a statement from Paul Davies' book, The Fifth Miracle, which is a book that he's written on the origin of life, where he says that although biogenesis strikes many as virtually miraculous, the starting point of any scientific investigation must be the assumption that life emerged naturally. And so it seems to me that what you've already done uh, by making a statement like that is essentially eliminated any possibility that if the scientific data really is driving you to the point that it looks as if intelligent agency is involved in the origin of life, that, that the scientific apparatus has rendered itself impotent to explore that question because of the way in which it's constrained by methodological naturalism. Yeah, that, I, I, let me say, I think that's a very good point. I think it's a very interesting point. And uh, I, I certainly, for one, would not deny the role of philosophy in this discussion. I mean, what the hell, I'm a professional philosopher, so <laughs> I, I'm not about to do that. Having said that, uh, Dr. Rana, I, I don't think it's just a question of gut commitments and um, what shall I say, just, okay, I'm just going to take a naturalistic position and I'm damned if I'm going to allow anything else. In other words, I'm ruling your position out a priori before I begin. I mean, first of all, notice that I have, at least in the context of this debate, already agreed that nothing I have said goes against the notion of a designer. I mean, as I say, out of the context of this debate, I've got other things to say. But in the context of this debate, I don't see this, for me anyhow, as a matter of designer or not designer. Um, I would want to say the following, is that there's a pragmatic reason for being a naturalist. It's not just a gut thing. Naturalism works. That when you get a problem, uh, as Thomas Kuhn told us in The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, the way that you deal with problems is not by throwing up your hands and saying, you know, in that Sidney Harris cartoon, ah, it's a miracle, you know? What did the, you know, the warders say in, you know, in, 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 in the uh, Shawshank Redemption when Andy isn't there? He said, it's a miracle. He's vanished like a fart in the wind. Well, you know, I mean, the point is, People don't vanish like farts in the wind. I mean, the simple fact of the matter is, you know, he poked it, and Andy had spent his time digging his way out. 
And what I want to say is again and again and again in the history of Western civilization, and I, I, I talk Western, you know, and I'm not saying it isn't the case for others too in Chinese or whatever. I want to say again and again and again, when we've had major problems come up, things that we can't solve, the way, you, the way you deal with it is not by throwing up your hands and saying it's a miracle. You say, as with a crossword puzzle, what am I missing? What am I missing? What don't I know? Let's go at it again. Let's try another way of doing it. And lo and behold, not necessarily in our generation, but in the next generation, answers come up. Now, I'm inclined to agree that there probably are some problems we can't solve. I'm not at all convinced that we'll ever solve the body-mind problem. Um, I, I don't think it's miraculous. I just don't, I'm not sure we're going to solve it. But I would say that, that naturalism has a pragmatic justification. So I'm quite prepared to say that this is a philosophical position. Of course it's a philosophical position. But I want to say there's a good reason for this philosophical position, and that is, it works. But it hasn't worked with the origin of life. <laughs> and I mean, are you not appealing to the future in order to essentially defend the, the commitment that someday uh, we'll have a, a, an explanation for the origin of life, and we have plenty of data at hand over the last 60 years that nothing seems to, to work, and some of the ideas are rather inventive and creative. Origin of life researchers are remarkable scientists in terms of their inventiveness and creativity. You know, but the point is, it, it, it is it, it's an incredibly complex problem. I'm not denying that. And 60 years, but I don't think 60 years, I mean, 60 years, you take something like sexual orientation. I think by and large these days, if you ask sex researchers, they'd say we've got a pretty good hand, handle on sexual orientation, that the way that the hormones and these sorts of things are involved in this, and prenatal uh, androgen levels and those sort of things. But it took a lot more than 60 years to start to get some sort of handle on that sort of issue. So I, I mean, with a complex problem like this, I don't think 60 years is, 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 is bad at all. <laughs> All right. Now, we can, we can go ahead and move, move to the next thing. Move to the next segment. What we have next is 10-minute uh, rebuttals, and Dr. Michael Roos will be the first one at the podium. I rather like quoting from the Bible. Maybe I'll use the first five minutes, you know, to read some of my favorite passages. Um, a re rebuttal. How does one rebut something like this? I mean, I think, in fact, in our, in our interaction just now, we were, in fact, getting to some of these sorts of things which are important. And, and basically, where I stand and why I take such a different position from Dr. Rana on this. I, I said in my first, in, when I, in my opening statement, I was worried about this whole business of taking a problem out of context. I, I, I looked, you know, to find whether they, I'm sure that there's a, an official term for this. I called it, you know, misplaced focus, the fallacy of misplaced focus or fallacy of taking out of context. And I, I just worry that when Dr. Rana gave his very sophisticated and at one level very convincing uh, analysis, uh, I, I was, all the time I was saying, yes, but isn't there something very peculiar about this? What you're doing is taking the results of a group of researchers, you're accepting their results, Time and again, you're showing us all of these highly sophisticated results. You're accepting these results. And yet somehow, you're going absolutely flatly against the kind of overall interpretation that each and every one of these people would have put upon it. In other words, there's, there's something not right here. You're taking every result that these people find about polymers and about DNA, RNA world, all of these sorts of things. You're saying, yes, you're right about this. 
But all of these people think that at some level they're on the way to some sort of solution. And what you're saying is, no, you're not. So there's, as I say, what worries me is I, I think we're taking this out of focus. And I just want to talk then, because I didn't talk very much about the origin of life. And I'm going to obviously retrack at a certain level what Dr. Rana said. But I'm going to tell you why I see it from the different point of view. And we were getting to this in our, in our interaction, and I'm glad we did. Because basically, I want to say, we don't come to this as, you know, as virgin. We don't come to this with no experience, never having done it before or anything like this. We come in as researchers, if we're origin of life researchers. We come in from a background of chemistry, probably some physics, a background of biology, where laws rule the world, where H2SO4 is H2SO4, and that, that's all, all there is to it. The, we, we come in without miracles. We come in and we face this problem, a problem which we have learned, and you're absolutely right, Dr. Rana, is horrendously more difficult than people thought in the halcyon days in the 1950s. And we've had 60 years of slog at this, and I don't think that there is any origin of life researcher who would want to say, okay, folks, we're skiing down the other side now. I don't think there's any one of them who would want to say that. On the other hand, I think that each and every one of them would say, you know, for all the difficulties, we're starting slowly to get some sort of view of what's going on. I've been looking, for instance, at the work of Jeff Bader, who works at the Scripps Institute just down the road, who's a, a, a big one for doing overall syntheses. And basically, he wants to say, and takes the very different interpretation from Dr. Rana on this, that yes, we do have some ideas now. We do now know, for instance, uh, as we said when we've, we've agreed on this, that life started about 3.78 3 billion years ago. Dr. Rana says, yes, but it happened so quickly, it couldn't possibly have been natural. Well, we're talking 100 million years or something like that, not necessarily that quick. And of course, we now know that evolution can, can take place very, very quickly indeed. So I think we've got plenty of time to do this. We do now know that, indeed, that we can artificially or uh, through mechanical means make the, the so-called building blocks of life, the amino acids and the building blocks of the, uh, the nucleic acids. Now, Dr. Rana is quite right to point out that early optimism about the atmosphere and that it was going to be sympathetic or welcoming to this uh, this sort of prebiotic soup is now long gone. But if you look at the researchers, they're far from convinced that, that it's gone completely and utterly. For instance, people like Bader say, yes, overall, the atmosphere probably wasn't that friendly. But if you look at what was going on around volcanic volcanoes and in the water around there, it's quite possible, quite possible, quite probable that uh, the building blocks of, of life were being formed, or were being and could be formed there. So in other words, that if you look at somebody like Bader, he says, th there's no question that the prebiotic soup hypothesis is, is still very much alive and well. Now, he's, Dr. Rana is quite right to say, but where do we go from here? But again, already, there, are, there is experimental work showing that you can make these long polymers, these long chain-like molecules. Again, there are problems. The best way to do these, uh, to form these, is on minerals. You need it fairly cool because if it's too hot, they're going to break up. But if it's fairly cool, the trouble is these damn polymers stick to the, stick to the minerals and you can't get them off. But then again, Experimenters have shown, ah, yes, normally that's the case. But if you keep it in salt water or something like this, it's surprising how easily you can get the molecules, these polymers, to break off. So in other words, again, nobody's saying absolutely that this is right. But we've got, we've got a sense of what's going on. And all the time, and this is, goes back to our discussion, all the time at the back, these people are saying, 
It's not that we're against miracles a priori, but we just don't see the, the, the need, the methodology for using miracles. We can keep going. Again, of course, the big breakthrough was the work which was done uh, uh, on, uh, with that, thanks to the work of people like Tom Check, the uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, showing that, the, uh, that RNA can self-replicate. A real a big breakthrough. Now, again, Dr. Rahn is right to say, ah, oh, yes, but RNA is not very stable. Is it possible that this could have happened, that RNA could have been put together? Isn't it too unstable? But of course, and Dr. Rana himself mentioned this, that there are suggestions that there may have been pre-RNA molecules like peptide nucleic acid, PNA, which is a great deal more stable, and that could then have gone on to do this. And again, big, big gaps, big gaps, and nobody's denying this between RNA and DNA and DNA and proteins, although there are reasons why DNA may well have been preferred over RNA, namely that DNA is a lot more stable uh, than RNA. So one can see reasons why natural selection would have, would have wanted that. At the same time, and Dr. Rana also mentioned the membranes, but again, we've got evidence that uh, fatty acids can make these sort of little vesicles and people like, well, Aparin, of course, the Russian uh, researcher was one who worked on this, but the late Sidney Fox was somebody who worked on this. None of this, none of this is giving you a cast iron analysis or proof of this is the way that life evolved. None of this is doing that, nobody pretending that. But it's equally foolish, even more foolish, to say we've got made no progress. And it's really silly, and I'm using this in a philosophical sense, so it's nothing personal. Uh, it's, it's really silly to say, oh well, throw up your hands and bring in miracles. Now, if you want to bring in miracles because you've got a Bible position, I'm not going to stop you. If you say, I've read my Bible, I've read Genesis, I'm committed to miracles, and that is my position, I'm not going to stop you. What I am going to say is, fair enough, but you're not doing science now. And I, my understanding is that somebody like Dr. Rana wants to say, my position is as scientific as yours. And that's where I want to differ from him. It's not because I'm against miracles a priori, I just think they, they haven't proven themselves necessary in the past, and I'm very, very, very far from convinced that they are needed at this point of time on the origin of life at work. There's Nobel Prizes out there, folks. There's Nobel Prizes out there, and appealing to Genesis 1-2 is not going to get you one. Thank you. Ten minute rebuttal, Dr. Fuzz Rana. Okay, let me go ahead and um, first comment on uh, this whole idea of a, of a creation model. And I didn't bring that up in my opening statement because I was focusing on addressing uh, the question at hand which again was, are natural processes sufficient to explain the origin of life? Uh, but one of the things that we are working on is developing a creation model, and th that is derived from scripture, uh, but is um, recast in the form of a scientific model, where we make predictions about what science should discover, and, and these predictions form essentially uh, a guiding framework in, in order to do research into the origin of life question. And I would actually defend that approach by, by noting that science, you know, very rarely proceeds from observation to theory. More often than not, the inspiration for scientific models comes from a variety of different places and sometimes some rather unusual places. Uh, for example, the German chemist Kekulé, who discovered 
uh, aromaticity, which is a very important property that molecules have, was working on trying to solve the structure of benzene, which was C6H6, and there was no way that anybody could figure out how to get that particular chemical composition to form any kind of molecule that people would have reasonably thought at that time could, could exist. And Kekulé, as the story goes, was having a dream and dreamed of a snake biting its tail, and from that, the story goes, had the inspiration to actually to think that maybe benzene was actually a ringed molecule, and in doing so, literally discovered a very important chemical property known as aromaticity. And so the point here is that Kekulé had a dream, and that dream served as an inspiration for a scientific hypothesis that he then went into the laboratory and, and put to the test. And that's essentially what we're doing at, at, at Reasons to Believe with regard to our creation model, is we're looking at the Genesis 1 creation account, we're treating it as if it was, again, a, a real natural history about what transpired on Earth, a natural history coordinated and orchestrated by a creator, and then what we're doing is we're taking that, that ideas, or the ideas from scripture, and we're recasting it in the form of a scientific model where we make predictions that can then be used to evaluate the model. And so I would argue that that is every much science as any kind of model uh, whatsoever. And uh, again, it's a model that is uh, predicated on relaxing the restrictions uh, of methodological naturalism where you in allow intelligent agency to play a role. Now, if you start from a different perspective, however, I still think you wind up with a situation where, again, the idea that life stems from an intelligent agent is, is a reasonable position based simply on, on observations and experiments that have been done over the last 60 years. Uh, because if you start, as I did in my opening statement, with, uh, with chemical evolutionary uh, scenarios for the origin of life, and you look at how those scenarios perform in light of, again, all the evidence at hand, what you see, again, is one intractable problem after the other. You brought up the idea of the, 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 the source of prebiotic materials. The fact of the matter is there's not an established source of prebiotic materials on the early Earth. Uh, the Miller-Urey experiment that was designed to argue that atmospheric chemistry was a source of prebiotic materials turns out to be irrelevant to the conditions that we think now exist on the early Earth. And if you actually take the atmospheric conditions that we think now existed on the early Earth and try a Miller-Urey type experiment, you get nothing, nothing forms in those experiments. Most researchers have abandoned atmospheric chemistry. Hydrothermal vent chemistry is very popular as a source, again, of prebiotic materials. And again, you can go in the lab and do some kind of simulation studies that seem to indicate maybe this chemistry is promising. But as Stanley Miller himself pointed out in a famous paper, that the extreme conditions of hydrothermal vents are really wonderful in terms of generating prebiotic compounds, but they also will actually destroy those compounds as soon as they form. The half-life of organic materials in hydrothermal vent environments is extremely short. In some instances, it's on the order of seconds. And so again, you have environments where you have uh, chemistry that can happen, but that, those environments are so harsh chemically and physically that destruction ensues almost immediately afterwards. Some people have argued that maybe prebiotic materials were delivered to the early Earth through asteroid and comet delivery or even just through the infalling of, of, of dust particles. And again, those scenarios have problems. Those are not only mechanisms that again allow for delivery to the Earth, but they also are highly destructive. Um, mechanisms as well. Flying through the atmosphere, these particles ignite because of frictional heating. When asteroids and comets strike the Earth, there's a tremendous amount of energy that's liberated that is highly destructive. Though it can also be a source of energy for some synthesis, it's extremely destructive. And if we simply look at the isotopic distribution of the organic deposits in the oldest rocks on Earth, they don't match the isotopic distributions that we see in organic materials from for meteorites, for example. Again, arguing against that, that possible scenario. And no matter what scenario you bring to the table, I can show you uh, legitimate scientific problems. And so you're in a position where no matter what you try, 
doesn't seem to work. But I'm not simply stopping at that point and saying, okay, uh, we can't explain it, therefore it must be God. I'm not arguing God of the gaps. I'm going one step further and I'm saying, let's look at the history of work done in prebiotic chemistry. What is the common denominator? The common denominator is that scientists have demonstrated proof of principle that the chemistry and the physics is possible, but in doing so, they have failed to show that that chemistry is robust enough to translate to the conditions of the early Earth or any conceivable environment in the solar system and beyond where life could originate. And in fact, the only reason those experiments work is because you have intelligent agents doing that. That is the second piece of evidence. I think that counts as evidence. That This is an empirical observation that's being made time and time again in labs all over the world with independent research groups being involved that intelligent agency seems to be the missing ingredient. You go to synthetic biology and again the creation of artificial cells. The missing ingredient in, in, the, uh, in the prebiotic experiments is, is fully acknowledged in synthetic biology and again life is not going to come uh, from simple chemical materials in a laboratory unless intelligent agents are intervening. And so these, I think, are positive pieces of evidence that suggest that maybe indeed a, a creator is necessary. And that bottom-up approach matches the top-down approach that we propose in the book Origins of Life. And again, you can develop uh, predictions that can be scientific, scientifically tested along those lines. And then you add to that mix the fact that that biochemical systems have at least minimally the appearance of design and again ironically they seem to be systems that are remarkable in their similarity to man-made designs. You've got another piece of evidence that again argues uh, for the work of an intelligent agent. So I hardly think it's a god of the gaps approach. I hardly think our approach is illegitimate. Uh, or, is it, or it's not scientific. I think the reason why people would say it's not scientific goes back to uh, the question I ask you. I think it's a philosophical position more so than anything else, where what becomes defining of science is methodological naturalism as opposed to what really I think defines science, which is the method, methodology of science. And you can easily employ that methodology of science to evaluate any any model or any hypothesis, regardless of where that hypothesis or model comes from. So I think we are practicing science in, in every sense of the word. So. We have a couple more segments before we get to your questions. Don't forget the text number 951-398 one one nine seven if you want to text in a question of course we'll have microphones set up during the q a time uh, so you can ask in person jot those down now and be prepared to ask them in just a few minutes the next segment is another cross-examination and on this one uh, dr rana is going to start the interrogation here we go okay. six minutes by the way a round of applause for our great timekeeper I would, I would like to get your reaction to um, some ideas that the science journalist John Horgan uh, wrote with regard to the origin of life in his book, The End of Science, which is a, somewhat of a controversial book. But uh, John Horgan, with respect to the origin of life question, refers to it as, as ironic science, in which he argues that origin of life research is, has more in common with literary criticism than actually a genuine scientific program where it's characterized by points of view, opinions, speculations, uh, where different exotic ideas come in and out of favor, but at the end of the day, the, none of the ideas are ever genuinely fully established, fully confirmed, or fully rejected. And it, it seems to me that this is actually a, a fairly uh, reasonable assessment, though a, a rather you know, uh, dark assessment of original life research. And I think that, that the problem there is that, again, you're locked into this naturalistic paradigm and you're not looking at what the data is suggesting to you. So how would you react to this idea that original life research is more in common with literary criticism than really science? 
you're asking some very good questions. Uh, you know, I, I, wish I, I wish I was as good as you at this. Um, um, <laughs> um, first of all, let's not knock literary criticism quite that much. Um, you know, there is something to be said for literary criticism. And I think it can be very revealing, for instance, if you're looking at Melville or looking at Dickens or something like that. I don't think it is purely postmodern stuff. I think you can make some progress there. And I think that that's the way that I would go at the, the whole origin of life issue. I mean, there's no question that at some level, origin of life has not so much a metaphysical, not so much a philosophical, but almost a metaphysical buzz about it. Um, if you like, a spiritual buzz about it. I mean, origin of life, this is, you know, this really is something which is exciting, which attra obviously attracts adventurers, cowboys, if you like, people like that. I mean, clearly, it, there's something about origin of life studies which does attract a certain personality. And I don't think anybody would deny that over the last, well, not just the last 50 years, but the last 500 years, there's been a hell of a lot of BS, or shall we call it literary criticism, done about at the origin of life studies. Um, and of course, it's not the only area of science where that happens. I mean, an area I've been very concerned about over the, the last 30 years has been so, human social behavior, sociobiology. And of course, people like Dick, uh, Dick Lewinton and Steve Gould, I think, rightly criticized you know, what they call just so stories. But I've seen that particular science. I mean, I'm not saying that it's firmly established in every way now. But I've seen that science take very seriously a lot of the criticisms and made big efforts to clean, clean up its act. And my sense is that this is also true of origin of life studies. There's no question that in the 1950s and 1960s, People were gung-ho, you know, the, 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 the Miller experiments, these things were on the way, it's just around the corner, folks. With, and then by the 70s, and you're quite right to point this out, it all started to fall apart. That, you know, the, the whole question of the early atmosphere, you're quite right, was nothing like as, as sympathetic -o as people thought. And you're quite right that, you know, even as they got the, the macromolecules, it became a lot more difficult to, you know, you're right, to point out there were all sorts of criticisms. And, you know, for a while it looked like deep sea vents were going to be the solution. And now people are pulling back from that somewhat because it, they're too damned hot. <laughs> um, so I, I'm not denying that that's the case. Nevertheless, I want to say that if you look at the overall history of the last 60 years, I think that through the mist, outlines are starting to emerge of the way that it worked. I think, I personally think that the, the RNA and RNA able to self-replicate and nobody's questioning that. I think that was a, a major breakthrough. Now, even if it's not exactly that way, at least it shows that the sorts of things that origin of life searchers are looking for are there. There's gold in them their hills. It's just a lot more difficult than we thought. So at one level, I want to roll with your criticism and agree with it. At another level, I want to say, but I don't think it's the end of the story. And of course, Hawkins writing, you know, he's writing a book where he wants to sell, and I've done that, and I'm sure you haven't because you're a good man, but I've done that, you know, and if you, you know, balance means boring, you know, so. Time for a quick... Oh, I'm good, I'm good. I'm good. All right. Thank you. I, I want to ask you a question now. Um, we gotta, it's got to run down, I guess. It's got to run down, oh my God. No, it doesn't have to. Hey, <laughs> six minutes, come on. <laughs> come on, we've all praised you and clapped you. Now, now we're on that clap. <laughs> all that applause ruined her. <laughs> yeah. I want to ask you a question. And, and uh, uh, Dr. Rana, I'm not asking, I mean, at one level, I'm not asking this to catch you, I, because I don't think you've tried to not catch me in your questions, and I appreciate the spirit in which you've asked them. What about when things go wrong? What about cancer? 
How is somebody like you going to answer this? You see, for somebody like me, who takes the Darwinian position, I want to say it's all a question of the laws. And, you know, things are going to go wrong because that's the way that laws work. And it, it, the, the trouble is, if you praise God for doing the hands-on good things, then when something goes wrong, why didn't God get in there and save that little girl from cancer? Now, my position is it's unbroken law, even if it, it including design, because this is the way it works. Now, I've got theological issues to deal with, obviously, but at least I can explain cancer. How do you explain cancer? Yeah, okay. Well, let, let me respond to that question by uh, looking at it in the context of biochemical design, and then we can extrapolate. Uh, because you're bringing up the, the idea that there appear to be bad designs in nature. Now, I don't think that that in and of itself is incompatible with a, a model that em employs intelligent agency, because it could be a designer that isn't necessarily all that, a, all that competent, let's say. But I believe that the designer is the God of the Bible, so to me it becomes a problem, because I think that we would expect to see good designs in nature, elegant designs in nature, if indeed it's the God of the Bible. So this is, a, I think, a legitimate uh, criticism of, of a design position. However, uh, one thing that I'll, I'll note is that oftentimes systems that appear to be bad designs turn out to be actually good designs upon further understanding of those systems. And I talk about this problem in my book, The Cell's Design, where I give many examples where that turns out to be the case. But also, uh, we would expect to see some bad designs in nature that are genuinely bad designs. Why would I say that? Because once uh, a creator puts in place, or an intelligent designer like the God of the Bible puts in place these elegant designs, they are now subjected to the laws of nature and they will undergo degradation and decay. So you do expect some designs that are essentially breakdowns of optimal designs. Now there are also other designs that maybe are not bad designs, but actually are suboptimal designs. And this actually reflects an engineering principle that when you have complex systems that are, uh, uh, in which you're attempting to perform many different things with those systems, they have, they're a multi-objective system, you can never optimize that each element of that system. You have to suboptimize the systems in order to perform overall Optim, or to have overall optimal performance. And we give many examples of that uh, in the cell's design. So when it comes to something like cancer, I would basically argue it, cancer is essentially a reflection of uh, a creation that operates according to laws of physics where things that are optimal wind up undergoing decay. So I probably would explain cancer very much in the same way that you would, but I don't think it, 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 it renders a design position untenable. Well, you see, what I want to say at a point like this is, then why do, you need, why do you want to get God involved in the miracle business in the first place? Because you're now saying that the, the God, your creator God, at some level is going to be constrained by these laws. That presumably, you know, presumably this God is not able, I, I take it, is not able to do other than what happens. Because surely a loving God is going to try to prevent those small children from dying of cancer. So already it seems to me, and you, you've said that yourself, you're going down, I don't know whether it's the slippery slope, but you're going down the path towards my position. And what I'm, I can't quite see is why you feel then it's necessary to stop going down that path. Why you can't just simply go the whole way and simply say, yeah, I believe in God. I believe in the God of Genesis. I believe in the God who made us in the image of God. All, I mean, all of those things. I'm not, I believe that we're sinful. All of those, all of those cr crucial things in Genesis. So I'm not here sneering at Genesis, but I don't understand why you're not prepared to say God did it through unbroken law and these things like cancer happen. Well, and, and our position is not either or, it's both and. In other words, we're not saying that God is running around performing 
interventions continuously, but God is intervening, but also is creating and working through process. And so again, it's, it's not either or. And part of the idea that God works through process relates to this concept of provident, providence, that God is providentially providing for his creation through putting in place his processes that help the creation to remain self-sustained. But it doesn't mean that God can't intervene in those processes or work through those processes. Uh, but it also means he, God can work outside. So to me, it's not either or, it's both and. And so what our project is, is to try to identify where it's process and where it's intervention. When it comes to the origin of life, I think that's a place where we see intervention. But I'm not saying that process isn't part of, of how God creates or how God providentially provides for his creation. Oh, I think that's pretty good. That wraps it up. Mm -hmm. Well... Closing arguments. This is your last shot from the podium. Formal address to this audience to persuade them before they get the chance to ask their questions. And we're going to start with Michael Roos. Well, I'm, I'm obviously not going to say anything new at this point. I just want to pull together what I've said before, because in a way, I'm, I'm seeing, you might say, why, why am I debating with somebody that I disagree so completely and utterly with? I mean, what's, what's the point of doing this? And I, I, I'm seeing that there is a great deal of point to doing this, because I think it's bringing out some really important issues about the nature of science, about the, the way that we think. I agree with Dr. Rana that the problem of the, the, the origin of life is one hell of a difficult problem. I don't think anybody wants to deny that. I agree with Dr. Rana that scientists today do not have a full or even an adequate solution. I agree with Dr. Rana that there have been a lot of, shall we call them cowboys in this business, who have, you know, done a lot of speculating, what, as I say, Stephen Jay Gould used to call just so stories. They talk about it in sociobiology. You certainly see it here. So I, I don't want to disagree with any of those sorts of things. However, what I want to say is it's so instructive, isn't it? You've got what is a horrendously difficult problem. We've now got, don't forget, but at the same time, we've now, since the Watson Crick bottle, we've now started to get some tools that we can explore this. At, at first it looked as though it was going to be easy peasy, but then within 10, 15, 20 years, it became clear that it was a lot more difficult than anybody thought a lot more difficult, and even today, I don't think anybody would want to deny that. So the question then is, where do you go from here? What, what's to be done? Do you throw up your hands? Do you take a biblical position? Now, as I say, if you're going to take a biblical position and a biblical position, I can't stop you, but you're not doing science anymore. The question is, do you, at some level, have this, if I call it a hybrid, Dr. Rahn will probably give me another word for it, but do you say, no, the science points me to miracles? And I want to say, no. I want to say no, because we are not coming to this problem, as it were, blank, without any experience, any more than coming to the Indian rope trick is blank without any experience. If I see the Indian rope trick or a boomerang, I don't immediately say, ah, Newton's laws don't work. I start to say, okay, what's going on here? Why does it look as though Newton's laws don't work? Because I know damn well they do. And I want to say exactly the same about the origin of life. It's a difficult problem. We've got some tools now. I think we are making some progress. We're not there yet. Probably we won't be there in my lifetime. I hope you'll be there in the lifetimes of some of you here, but perhaps not even then. But that's no reason to give up. That's no reason to give up the naturalistic approach. That's no reason to turn to miracles, not for religious reasons, but for scientific reasons. I want to say this is a paradigmatic example 
of a really tough problem where we've got some tools, an exciting, interesting, tough problem, and it's a paradigmatic example of why science doesn't give up, why science says we're not there yet, but let's keep trying because it's, the answers are there. The problem is not with the, it's, the problem is not with the problems, it's with our abilities to solve those problems. That, if you like, in Thomas Kuhn's language, these are puzzles, not problems. I don't think anybody is ever going to solve, what shall I say, the Palestinian question. I mean, I, give, give, I don't think anybody's going to solve the American Senate problem. I think that that is a problem which is insoluble. I don't think there's any solution to that. It's not a puzzle. There's no solution. But I do think that the origin of life is a puzzle. I do think that there's a solution. And I want to say, let's get at it. And isn't that, isn't that exciting? And to, to, to quote Genesis, isn't that what being made in the image of God is all about? Trying to explore that wonderful world that he's given us with the abilities that he's given us. Thank you. Dr. Fuzrana, final comment. Five minutes. Well, I think what you've heard tonight are two presentations. One you might say is a ruse, and one you might say was based on fuzzy logic. Um, I wish I could be as clever as you, Dr. Ruse. <laughs> anyway, that's my, my feeble attempt. Um, what I basically tried to do tonight is to argue that, again, the origin of life and the complexity of the cell require the work of intelligent agency in order to account uh, for, again, the emergence of life on Earth. And I've demonstrated, or I attempted to demonstrate, that every explanation for the origin of life through chemical evolution encounters significant problems, encounters dead ends. Many of these problems appear to be intractable. I've shown that when you look at the work in prebiotic chemistry, the role of intelligent agency cannot be ignored in making laboratory experiments successful that's, that appear to validate different stages in the origin of life process. And it's, it's because of the central importance of intelligent agency in these experiments that I've argued that, again, the origin of life appears to be the work of a mind. Again, the, the, the work in synthetic biology, attempting to create life in the lab, leads us to the, a similar type of conclusion. I've also talked about the design and biochemical systems that, again, I think points us to the work of a mind. So you have four separate lines of argumentation that lead us to essentially the same conclusion. Now, uh, as I have been critical of work in the origin of life, I want to be clear that I do have tremendous amount of respect and admiration for the scientists that are engaged in this work. Uh, they are a breed of un, unto themselves who are, are people that are consumed with I believe to be one of the most difficult problems in science. So I have nothing but admiration and respect for them. And the more that I study the work in Origin of Life research, the more I appreciate, again, the ingenuity and the insight that these researchers have brought to this problem. But again, time and time again, uh, the ideas that have been proffered turn out to, to not withstand the rigors of scientific testing. I believe it is possible to develop a scientific model that employs the work of an intelligent agent, a creator. And one of the things we're doing at Reasons to Believe is developing a, a scientifically testable creation model where we attempt to take these ideas from the realm of reading through the creation accounts in Genesis into the scientific arena where we're willing to put our ideas uh, to, the, to the test, where we're, we're putting our ideas in harm's way. And, and I think the, our model actually performs rather well in the face of those types of challenges. At the end of the day, this is really very much a discussion about the nature of science itself. Is science about 
methodological naturalism, where only a certain category of explanations are allowed, or is science first and foremost about a methodology that takes hypotheses, ideas, theories, models, and the predictions that emanates from them and applies scientific testing to those ideas and allowing the best models to, per to persist and discarding those models that are failed models. And so again, I think it's very much a question of the philosophy of science to some degree. And I, as a scientist, would like to think that science has the capacity to discover truth as opposed to science being a game that is played where we only are looking for natural process explanations. I think methodological naturalism actually makes science impotent to answer some of the most important questions, not only in science, but in mostly important questions to humanity at large. Uh, one of the critiques of our position, of course, are the bad designs found in nature, or presumably bad designs found in nature, and I believe it's possible to develop a robust response to that very, very much that legitimate criticism. So again, uh, at the end of the day, I believe that I have, have demonstrated and made my case that indeed intelligent agency is required for the origin of life, and as much as I respect Dr. Ruse, I'm not sure that he's convinced me that natural processes are sufficient. Uh, what I see him doing, and I see other origin of life researchers do this as well, is essentially appeal to the future. And this is essentially a logical fallacy because we need to evaluate this question with the data that we have at hand today. And that data that we have at hand today suggests intelligent agency is required to account for the origin of life.